I find it very melodious. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you to remain in this of recitation of the Quran for many, many more years and may you, inshallah, inspire so many others, inshallah. Abu Bakr Halanti is from Mount View, close by. Adhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. 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 Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa nukminu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi. Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiyati amalina. Ma yahdi illa fala mudillala wa ma yudlilu fala hadiyala. Nashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika la Wa nashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh Qala Allah tabarak wa ta'ala Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi Ya ayu al-lazina amanu Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli ala sayyidina muhammadin وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وأصحابه وبارك وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters in Islam it is my privilege and an honor for me to be able to address you this evening in the company of such illustrious people I've already mentioned our brother here, Abu Bakr Halant, next to me is Salih Muhammad, the owner of Razmid, who has always involved himself, himself in this type of method of spreading the da'wah. And I've had the privilege of serving with him and with our brother Ahmad Didat, we all probably know is currently ill. May Allah bless him, inshallah, with good health and with long life, inshallah. We also have in the audience a brother from Somalia, Sheikh Abdurrahman Muhammad. Welcome, brother. I trust you will enjoy it as much as we are. I now have the privilege of saying to you that I welcome to Hanover Park, first time around for him, our brother from a place called Dongri in Bombay, Dr. Abdul, Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik. The doctor signifies that he is indeed a medical doctor by profession, but he tells me that he has been inspired by the works of our brother Ahmad Didat and he has taken it upon himself to see that he spreads the deen of Islam in the same manner, perhaps with differences here and there, as Ahmad Didat. He is currently the president of the Islamic Research Foundation in Dongri, in Bombay. He features every day on the television in India for three hours. With Allah's Qudrat, he has had, according to him, much success. Many people have phoned him and many people have reverted back to the fold of Islam. But it is nice to have quality people here who will listen attentively and who will similarly be inspired the way our brother has been inspired in the past. I'm not going to keep you here from my side for too long. We have the topic for tonight, something which we have to listen to very carefully. We either do da'wah work or, we'll have, or we will have to face destruction. As we all know, the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told the people then on his farewell sermon, those of you who are present here today must see that you take the message to those who are not here. 
You did not come to listen to me. We now have the privilege to call upon our brother, Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik. But before I do, do that, I would like to remind you and to inform you if you don't know, and also that you carry the message that tomorrow, inshallah, after Dhuhr, Dr. Naik will be at the Abibia Masjid. Tomorrow evening, after Maghrib, he will be at Masjid al Quds in Gatesville. On Monday evening, is it Ba'd al Isha or Ba'd al Maghrib? Do you know? Ba'd al Isha at York Road Masjid in Lansdowne. Sukh Shukru will be in Masjid. And then on, Maitland, on Monday, after Dhuhr, he will be in Maitland Masjid. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I now hand you with pleasure over to Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik of Bombay. Shukran. Auzu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lil-naz. Ta'amiruna bil-ma'aruf wa tanhawna an al-munkar. Wa tu'miruna billah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shuali sadri. Wa yassir li amri. Wa ahlu al-ugdata min lisani yakkahu kawli. I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, blessings and mercy of Almighty Allah be on all of you. Before we deal with the topic of today, I would like to make a request that as all of you may be aware that Sheikh Ahmed Didad just about two weeks ago he has suffered a very severe stroke and at present he is in a very serious condition. I would request the brothers and sisters that we should make dua that he once again gets back his fitness and health. And at present he has been flown today morning to Riyadh where he is undergoing treatment at the Riyadh hospital. And we make dua that we once again have Uncle Ahmed Didad back with us. The topic of this evening's talk is Dawa or destruction. What do you mean by the word Dawa? It is the same as the word Dawat. But the moment you hear the word Dawat, it reminds you of a lunch party or a dinner party. Dawa does not mean a lunch party or a dinner party. It actually means an invitation. But today, we will not be speaking about an invitation to a lunch party or a dinner party, but we'll be speaking about Dawatul Islam, the invitation to Islam, the invitation to Deen al Haq, the religion of truth. An invitation is only given to an outsider. Therefore, Dawa is to be done to the non-Muslims. When we speak about Islam to the Muslims, it's called as Islam. But when we preach the message of Islam, or we speak about Islam to the non-Muslim, it is known as Dawah. I start my talk by quoting a verse from the Holy Quran, from Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number 110, which says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas, that, oh, ye are the best of people, evolve for mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us Muslims as the kuntum khaira ummatin that ye are the best of people evolve for mankind. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an honor. But always, along with the honor, it is also followed up with responsibility. For example, in a school, the principal has got more honor than the teacher. The teacher has got more honor than the clerk. In the same fashion, the principal has got more responsibility than the teacher. And the teacher has got more responsibility than the clerk. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us Muslims as the kuntum khaira ummatin, that ye are the best of people evolved for mankind, but natural, we also have a responsibility. The same verse gives the answer. It says, Ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah. That we enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us the kuntum khaira ummatin because we enjoy what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. If we don't enjoy what is good and if we don't forbid what is wrong, we are not kuntum khaira ummatin. We are not fit to be called the best of people. We aren't fit to be called as Muslims. Therefore, according to the Holy Quran, it is compulsory that we enjoy what is good and we forbid what is wrong. That is, we speak to the non-Muslims about Islam, about the good things, and we prevent them and we forbid them from the evil. That's the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran gives us this honor. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the Holy Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 143, He says, You are the middlemost community. You are the Ummat al -wast. You are a justly balanced community. And you have to be a witness over the nation. And the messenger will be a witness over you. It is the duty of every Muslim to be a witness over the other nation. It's compulsory that we speak about Islam to the non-Muslims. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he will be a witness on us on the Day of Judgment. Amongst all the surahs of the Holy Quran, Surah Toba happens to be the most military surah of the Holy Quran. Why do I say that Surah Tawba is the most militant surah of the Holy Quran? Because it's the only chapter of the Holy Quran, it's the only surah which does not begin with the beautiful formula Bismillah Rahman Rahim, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Otherwise, if you analyze all the other 113 chapters of the Holy Quran, Start with the beautiful formula, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. For example, if you read the Quran, it says, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Qul Auzu Bi Rabbil Nas, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Qul Auzu Bi Rabbil Falak, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Qul Huallahu Ahad. Every chapter of the Holy Quran begins with the beautiful formula. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. But Surah Tawbah does not begin with this formula. Why? Because in the Surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a warning. And when a warning is given, Bismillah is uncalled for. For example, if suppose you are walking with your wife or with your sister on the road, or suppose I am walking with my wife or with my sister on the road, and suppose there is a hooligan who snatches away the bag of your wife or of your sister and he runs away, but natural, you will try and catch him. And if you catch him, you will not say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, 
You will not say in the name of Allah most gracious, most merciful. You will not say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. You will not say may peace be on you. You will get to the topic directly. Hey mister, give the handbag or I'll break your arm. Hey mister, give the handbag or I'll break your neck. You directly get to the subject. Similarly, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Tawbah, when he's giving a warning to the mushriks, to the pagans of Makkah, Bismillah is uncalled for. Because if we read Surah Tawbah, the first four verses, there is a peace treaty between the mushriks of Makkah and the Muslims. And this treaty was unilaterally broken by the mushriks of Makkah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them a warning and says, you put things back in place or a declaration of war. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 5 of Surah Tawbah that after the four forbidden months are over, you should fight the pagans of Makkah. That means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them four months to put things back. Otherwise, a declaration of war. But by the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 24. We Muslims, he's addressing us. Now, we are in the firing line. And he says in the Holy Quran, of Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 24, he says, Qul in kana abawkum, say, whether it be for your fathers, wa or your sons, wa or your brothers, wa or your spouses, your wives or your husbands, wa or your relatives. What are your considerations? Your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your spouses, your relatives. What are your considerations? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking, what are your considerations? Is it your father? See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, in Surah Isra chapter number 17, verse number 23, that I have ordained for you that you worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you be kind to your parents. After worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, next to it is being kind to your parents. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 135, he says, Ya amin, O you who believe, stand out firmly for justice and as witness to Allah, even if it be against yourself, against your parents or the relatives or the rich and poor. For Allah protects both. That means you have to respect your parents. But if they go against justice, if they go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can even go against them or against your own self. So Allah continues in Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse 24, in kana abawkum, wa abnaukum, wa ikhwanukum, wa azwajukum, wa ashiratukum. Say with the be for your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your spouses, your relatives. The wealth that he have amassed, the business in which he deal, the houses in which you delight, what are your consideration? The wealth that he have amassed. Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 261 that if you sow one grain in the way of Allah, Allah will give you seven years each year bearing a hundred grain. That means Allah promises you to give 700 times if you invest in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to know which business in this world will give you 700 times profit. That is 70,000 percentage. A profit of 70,000 percent. So Allah says that the wealth that they have amassed what are consideration? The business in which you deal, that if I go in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe I will lose business, I will lose my friends, the houses in which you delight. And Allah continues. Ahabba ilaykum min Allahi wa rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabilihi. That if you love all these things more than Allah, His Rasul, and doing jihad in the way of Allah. 
Allah says, Fatarabbasu. You wait. Hatta yahti Allah bi Until Allah brings about his decision unto you. Until Allah brings about his destruction unto you. Wallahu la yadil komus fasakin. And Allah guides not the perverted transgressors. Allah is telling us Muslims that if you love all these eight things more than Allah, his Rasul, and doing jihad in the way of Allah, Allah says, Fatarabbasu. You wait. And believe me. We Muslims are waiting, sitting on our backside doing nothing. What does Allah mean when He says, wait? What does He mean? Suppose when a teacher, when she's teaching in a class, and she tells the student, when they're reading a book, that look out for a word. The teacher is actually meaning that you should look in the book, not look out of the book. That is the genius of the language. When the teacher says, look out, she's actually meaning the student should look in. Similarly, suppose in a school, there's a senior student who tries to bully a junior student. And the junior student tells the senior student that you wait till I get my elder brother. And the elder brother happens to be the biggest hooligan of that area. So the junior student is actually warning the senior student that you better improve or you will be taught a lesson. When he says, wait till I get my elder brother, he's actually telling him that you buzz off, that you scoot, otherwise you'll be taught a lesson. In the same fashion, when Allah says, Fatarabbasu, Allah says, wait, that means you Muslims, you better improve, otherwise destruction will come upon you. Allah is giving a warning. We are in the firing line. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Muhammad, chapter number 47, verse number 38, he says, Wa in tatawallaw, yastabdin kaumun gayrakum, summa layakun amsalakum. That if you do not do the job, if you turn away from the path, Allah will substitute in your place another people, summa layakun amsalakum, and they will not be like you. The Holy Quran says that the people who Allah has given an honor to, if they do not do their job, Allah will substitute in their place another people. Summa laikunam salakum, and they will not be like you. If we see history, and if we read the Holy Quran, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He had chosen the Jews, and He delivered the message to the Jews, and He chose them as the people to deliver the message. But these Jews, they were too proud. They said, why should you deliver the message to the ignorant people? And if you read the Holy Quran, it's mentioned in Surah Jummah, chapter number 62, verse number 5, that when the Jews were asked to deliver the law of Moses, that is the Mosaic law, they did not do the job. Their similitude is like a donkey, like an ass carrying tons of books, but he understands not. So the Jews, the Jews look down upon the Arabs. These ignorant people, what will they understand the message of God Almighty? It's useless giving the message to them. And if you know history, even the invaders, they bypassed the Arabs because the Arabs were looked down upon. It was the days of ignorance. Yom al Jahiliya. It was called the days of ignorance. And the invaders, they did not even feel like ruling Arabia. You know why? Because they were so ignorant, the Arabs. They did the tawaf around the Kaaba absolutely naked. They had a logic. They said that what is a better way to present ourselves to God Almighty than the way in which we came down in this world. So they said that we will do the tawaf around the Kaaba absolutely naked. So the Jews looked down upon the Arabs and Allah has his ways. When he substitutes the people who are not doing the job, Allah chooses those people who are looked down upon. Allah 
brings those people from the dust and he makes them sit on your head. Allah has his way. Allah has his law. Yes, tab de common kairoku. Allah will substitute in your place and other people. And these people which Allah chooses are the most ignorant people. The people who you look down upon. So Allah later on chose the Arabs. And with the Holy Quran, they became the torchbearers. Allah then chose them, made them the Quntum Khaira Ummatim, the Muslim. But if you see history, whenever we do not do the job, we are substituted. For example, if you know the history of Spain, we Muslims, we ruled Spain for about 800 years, but did not do the job, did not do the dawah. When the Crusaders came, there was not a single man who, who could openly give the adhan. We were wiped out. Why? Because we did not do the job. We did not deliver the message. Allah has his way. If you do not do the job, Allah will substitute in your place and other people. Summa laikunam salakum. And they will not be like you. We Muslims, we say that we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than anyone in the world. We love him the maximum. We love him more than a father, more than a mother, more than our family members. We love him the maximum. But do we actually believe in what we say? Suppose your neighbor, if he abuses your mother or if he abuses your sister, and if you get back home, and when you come to know that he has abused your sister or your mother, what will you do? You will see to it that you teach the neighbor a lesson. If you physically cannot do it yourself, what will you do? You will hire someone else to do the job. You see to it that your neighbor is taught a lesson. He's put in his place. Why? Because we love our mother. We love our sister. We respect our mother. But if you read the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is crying. He is crying out in Surah Maryam, chapter number 19, verse number 88. He cries out, وَقَالُ اتَّقَذُ Rahman Walada, That they say, the Christian, that Allah most gracious has begotten a son. وَقَالُ اتَّقَذُ Rahman Walada, لَقَدْ جِدْتُمْ شَيَا idda. Indeed, it's a most monstrous thing to say that Allah has begotten a son. Allah says that they say, the, the Christians, that Allah has begotten a son. Indeed, it's a most monstrous thing to say. As though the skies are ready to burst. And the earth to split asunder, what the khairul jabalu hadda, and the mountains to fall down to utter ruin. Imagine when they say that Allah has begotten a son, as though the skies are ready to burst, the earth to split open, and the mountains to fall down to utter ruin. That they should say that Allah most gracious has begotten a son. Imagine it's the biggest abuse. You can give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But believe me, our neighbors, they are abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our neighbors, they say that Allah has begotten a son. But believe me, nothing is happening to us Muslims. Why? We say, we love Allah more than our mother, more than our sister. When someone abuses our sister or our mother, we get agitated. We want to teach the neighbor a lesson. But when the neighbor abuses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't want to interfere. It is not affecting us a little bit. Our Christian neighbor, he says that according to the Bible, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in him shall have everlasting life shall not perish, but have everlasting life. 
They say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is the begotten son of God. But are we making any effort to correct our Christian brothers? Have we ever told them to explain the meaning of the word begotten? They say that according to the first epistle of John, chapter number five, verse number seven, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And they say, and they believe in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Have we ever told them that what they believe is wrong? Have we ever told what the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 171? Quran says, Don't say Trinity. Desist, stop it, it's better for you. Have we ever opened our mouth? Have we made an effort to correct them? We say that we love Allah more than anyone in the world. But do we actually mean it? We look around us, that our Hindu brothers, they say that Allah has begotten a son. But have we made any effort to correct them? They call us for festivals. And you may be knowing about the common festival, that is Ganesh Chaturthi, especially celebrated in Maharashtra, the place where I come from. And they call us for puja. And many of our brothers, the Muslims, they go for the puja and they even have the offering which they make to God Almighty, their so-called God Almighty. That is, they have the prasad. The Quran clearly gives you the message in no less than four different places. In Surah Bakra, chapter number two, verse number 173. In Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number three. In Surah Anam, chapter number six, verse number 145. And in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 115, it says, Hurramat alaykum ul maitu tuwaddamu wa rahmul khinzeer. Wa ma uhullah li gare laqi. That's forbidden for you for food, ah? Dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which the name of anyone besides Allah has been taken. The Quran forbids you from having any food on which any name besides Allah has been invoked in no less than four different places. And when the Hindus, when they give us the prasad, we go to the function, we go to the puja, and we even have the prasad. We are testifying, we are giving shahada to them that we believe Allah has begotten a son. Imagine, it's a shame on us. Allah is crying in the Quran that it is the most worst abuse you can give to him. And we Muslims, many of our brothers, we go to their functions and we testify that what they're saying is absolutely correct. We say that how can we hurt the feelings of our friend? How can we hurt the feeling? I mean, we have to live with them in harmony. So we are giving shahada that Allah has begotten a son. Have you ever made an effort to correct them? It is so easy. You can yet keep a good relationship with them and correct them. The only thing you have to do when you go to the puja of Ganesh Chaturthi, you have to ask him that, my dear brother, who is this Ganesh? Who is this Ganesh? So the Hindu friend will tell you that Lord Ganesh, he is the son of Lord Shiva. That means Lord Shiva has a son by the name of Lord Ganesh. One day when Shiva, when he had gone on expedition, for long expedition, his wife Parvati, she takes out dirt from a body and she makes a son. And one day she tells the son, that see, I am resting in the house. You guard the entrance of the house and don't allow anyone to come into the house because I don't want to be disturbed. And this thing takes place when Lord Shiva is away on expedition. At that moment, Lord Shiva comes back to the house. And when he's about to enter the house, this Lord Ganesh, he stops his father. And he says that you cannot enter the house. My mother is resting. I mean, this thing is told to you by your Hindu friend. You don't have to tell him this. 
he will tell you when you ask him who is this Lord Ganesh, he will describe to you the story of Lord Ganesh. So the son of Parvati, he stops Shiva from entering the house and says that my mother is resting. Lord Shiva, he gets infuriated. He gets wild that who is this young boy trying to stop me from entering my own house? He's so angry that he chops off the head of his own son. Imagine, you have to ask him the question that when your Lord Shiva, he cannot identify his own son, how will he identify me? When your God cannot identify his own son, how will he identify me? And the story continues that the head was chopped off so hard that it goes away miles, thousands of miles. So when he realizes his mistake, Lord Shiva, he says that the first animal you come across, chop off the head of that animal and bring that head to me. So the first animal they come across is an elephant. So they chop off the head of the elephant and Lord Shiva takes the head of the elephant and he puts it onto the body of a son and you have a hybrid, an elephant man. And this person is called Lord Ganesh. So you ask him that do you worship such a god? Then the Hindu friend will tell you, see, this is all mythology. It's mythology. You know, fairy tale. See, we are in a modern world. You have to tell him that, brother, do you believe in this? He will tell you, no, no, this is only mythology. You tell him that, see, brother, I want to have that prasad, but you prove to me that Lord Ganesh is God. You prove to me and I will have it. He will say, these are fairy tales. He will say, Daniel, don't have that prasad. You have to educate him. You have to do the job. You have to do the job with hikmah. You don't have to insult him. You don't have to abuse him. You have to ask simple questions, innocent questions, and that will do the job. Because the Holy Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, that revile not those people who worship God besides Allah. Abuse not those people who worship God besides Allah. Lest in their ignorance, they will revile Allah. They will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't have to abuse them. You have to ask them questions and they themselves will realize that how illogical the belief is. If you read the Holy Quran, the Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 120, it says, Walan Tarda, Ankal Yahudu, Walan Nasara, Hatta Tattabiyu Millatihum. That means the Jews and Christians, they will never be satisfied until you follow their brand of religion. And Allah tells you in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 111, he says, that they say, وَقَالُوا لَا يَذْكُرُ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُدَنَوْ نَسَارًا The Jews and Christians, they will tell you that you Muslims, you shall never enter Jannah until you become a Jew or a Christian. They come knocking at our doors and they tell us that you Muslims, with your Tawheed, with your Salah, with your Zakah, with your fasting, with your Hajj, you shall never enter Jannah until you become Jew or Christian. They are challenging us. Allah says, Tilka amani yuhu. This is the wishful thinking. This is the bakwas. Kul hatu burhanakum. Tell them, produce your proof. In kuntum sadiqin. But if you're truthful, we have to ask them to produce their proof. If they speak the truth. And believe me, they have produced their proof. That is the Holy Bible. They say, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. And they have produced the Holy Bible in no less than 2,000 different languages. What language you understand? The Bible is there in that language. They have produced the Burhan. What do we have to do? Do we have to follow it hook, line and sinker? When anyone produces his proof, what do we do? You verify the proof. You verify the identity. So we have to read the Bible and check 
whether the Burhan is truthful or not. Have they done it? Believe me, these Christian missionaries, they read, they read our Quran and they are making life miserable for us. They come knocking at our doors throughout the world. In every part of the world, they come knocking at our doors. And they say, let's see, it is mentioned in your Holy Quran that the Bible is the word of God. I mean, most of us Muslims will, be, will say yes. The Holy Quran says that Bible is the word of God. So the next question is, why don't you follow the Bible? Believe me, we have no answer. They come knocking at our doors and they say that your beloved prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him, he is mentioned by name in the Holy Quran only five times. But the name of Jesus peace be upon him is mentioned 25 times. Who is greater? These missionaries, they don't give you the answer. They let your mind think. They don't give you the answer. They only pose the question, who is greater? And they pose the next question. That Muhammad peace be upon him. He had a mother and father. The Muslims will say yes. He had a mother and a father. Did Jesus peace be upon him? Did he have a father? He said no. Yes, he had a mother. Mother Mary, may Allah be pleased with her. But we believe that he was born without any male intervention. He had no father. So who is the father of Jesus, peace be upon him? They ask the question. They don't give the answer, but they let your mind think. Who is greater? A person who has a father and mother, or a person who has a mother but no father? Who is greater? They ask you the question, but they don't give you the answer. They let your mind think. They come knocking at our doors. They say that, did your beloved prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him, did he give life to the dead? We say, yes, we believe in many of his miracles, but we don't know of any in which he gave life to the dead. Did Jesus peace be upon him according to you? Did he give life to the dead? We say, yes, it's mentioned in the Quran. He said, Bismillah, wake up in the name of Allah. So who's greater? Who's greater of the two? They don't give you the answer. They let your mind think. They use as Muslims as a punching bag. They use as Muslims as the doormats. They keep on posing questions. They ask the question that your beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is he dead or alive? You say, see, our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he's Hayatul Nabi. Spiritually, he's alive. But there's no physically, is he dead or alive? We have to agree that physically he's dead. He's buried in Medina. Jesus, peace be upon him. Is he dead or alive? We believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was raised up alive. So who's greater? They ask you the question. They don't give you the answer. They let your mind think. They are using us as punching bags, as doormats. We are scapegoats. And believe me, we are supposed to be the people who are supposed to dawah, to propagation. But these people, they are so dedicated, even with the falsehood, they are so firm. The maximum missionary that you'll find in any religion is in Christianity. They are making life miserable for us. What are we to do? Shouldn't we make an effort to correct these people? And Quran gives you a way how to do the job. The answer to all these questions is given clearly in the Holy Quran. But how many of us read the Quran with understanding? The Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, it says, Qul, ya ahil al-kitab, say, O people of the book, ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa in bainan o bainukum, that come to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'amuda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushika bihi, that we associate the partners with him. Wala yattakiza bazun abazun arbabun min dunillah, that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fa'in tawalla. If then they turn back. Fa'kulu shadu. Say we bear witness. Bianna muslimun. 
that we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the Holy Quran of Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, is the master key for dawah. It shows you a way how to do dawah with the Ahli Kitab, with the Jews and Christians. If it works for the Hindus, use it. If it works for the Sikhs, use it. It's a master key. It says, Ta'ala wila qalmatil sawa'im, bainana wa bainakum. That come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushika bihi. That we associate to partner with him. We have to open our mouths. We have to do the job. But we Muslims, we are intelligent. We are intelligent in making excuses. We say, let's see, I don't have enough knowledge. We pass the buck on. That since we don't have enough knowledge, we are not the fittest people to do dawah. Dawah is somebody else's job. Our beloved Prophet said, Balligo anni aya. That propagate even if it be one verse. Means even if you know one verse about Islam, it's your duty to propagate it. I want to know that which Muslim in this world does not know one verse about Islam. Every Muslim, he has to at least know one verse about Islam. He at least has to know, La ilaha illallah, that there is no God but Allah. Whatever he knows, it's his duty to convey the message to those people who do not know it. See, we go to the mosque and we pray. And when we pray, our Imam, he reads after Surah Fatiha in the Salah, he reads, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, say is Allah one and only, Allah hu samad, Allah the absolute, the eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Walam yakul lahu kuffan ad. And there is nothing unto him like in this world. The Qari is saying, the Imam, he's reading, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. I want to know that the Muslims that come in the mosque, do they not believe that Allah is one and only? Of course they believe. So what is the message we are getting in our salah? We are getting the message that Kul Hu Allahu Ahad. Say He is Allah and only. We have to go out and say to those people who do not believe that God is one, we have to tell them that God is one. Irrespective whether you can convince them or not. Your job is to deliver the message. The Quran says in Surah Ghashiya, chapter number 88, verse number 21. فَزَكِّرْ إِنَّ مَا أَنْتَ مُزَكِّرْ That your job is to deliver the message. Your job is to do zikr. Whether they accept or not, you leave it in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your job is to deliver the message. Whatever you know, if you know there is one God, tell your non-Muslim friend that there is one God, there is one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he asks you for proof, how can you prove that there is one God? How can you prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now, the moment you do not know the answer, what do you do? You come home and you do the homework. You find out the answer. That how can you prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How can you prove that there is one God Almighty? And believe me, now you don't have to do much of research. Everything is available on your fingertips. Now science and technology has advanced. I had given a talk a few months ago in Bombay on is the Quran, the word of God. And I've proved logically and scientifically, even to the atheist, the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You only have to get the answer and repeat it. The moment you find the answer, and when you tell your friend that see, this is the answer, how you can prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can you prove that there is one God Almighty? And after he's convinced, you are a master of one question. Then you go to the next part. That, see, you have to offer the salah. The what is the proof? What is the proof that the Muslims, the way you Muslims offer salah is right? If you don't know the answer, you come home and you do your homework. You can prove logically and scientifically 
that the way we Muslims pray is the best. We can prove to the Christian from his Bible that the way we offer Salah is the right way. Now you are a master of two questions. Then tell him, you should not have four. He'll ask you, what proof do you have? Why do you say that we should not have four? If you don't know the answer, you'll come back and do the homework. Now you are a master of three questions. In this way, your knowledge increases. You don't have to wait till you become like Sheikh Didal or some great speaker and, and then you say that now I'll do Dawah. A prophet said, Balligo anni walabaya. Propagate even if you know one verse about Islam. You have to start immediately. You can't wait for tomorrow. But there are Muslims who give several excuses for not delivering the message. They say that, see, first we Muslims, we should improve our own Muslim brothers. And then, after our Muslim brothers are improved, then we should go and speak to the non-Muslim. First, we have to make the Musliman fakka Musliman. We'll make the Muslim a good Muslim, and afterwards, we will deliver the message to the non-Muslim. Believe me, that time will never come. That time will never come. It's impossible to make all the Muslim fakka Musliman. Our beloved Prophet could not do that. Believe me. He delivered the message to his family members. He could, not, he could not convince his own uncle. His own uncle did not accept Islam. Do you think you're better than the Prophet? No, first we have to improve our own people. Then deliver the message to the other people. Do you know the reason why they say this? Because it's easy. If I tell a Muslim that brother you should offer Salah, even if he does not pray, he will not retaliate. He will listen to you quietly. Bhai sahab, dai rakho, keep a beard. Even if he does not like it, he will not retaliate. Give your zakah. Even if he is not giving, he will not retaliate. But if you speak about Islam to the non-Muslim, there will be a reaction. There may be a retaliation. So we want to do the easy job. We want to choose, we don't do the job, we want to choose the easy part. And we pass the buck on. And we give excuses for not delivering the message. Our beloved Prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, as mentioned by the chairman, in the farewell pilgrimage, he said, there were more than 110,000 Sahabas, companions of the beloved Prophet. And he asked them, that, did you get the message? And all of them unanimously said, Beshak. Yes, we got the message. Then the Prophet said, all those who are present here, you have to deliver the message to those who are not present here. And believe me, there were less than 10,000 Sahabas who were buried in Arabia. More than 100,000 Sahabas went outside Arabia. For what? For making Musliman pakka Musliman? For delivering the message to the non-Muslims. For doing da'wah. And even at the time of the Prophet, when the Prophet lived in Medina, it's mentioned in the Hadith that our Prophet said, there were many Muslims who did not come for the compulsory congregation. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, that they did not come for the Jummah Salah to the mosque. The Prophet felt like burning their houses. That means, even at the time of the Prophet, there were Muslims who were not good Muslims. They did not come for the compulsory congregation. They did not come for the Jummah Salah. But still, our beloved Prophet, he sent letters to the various non-Muslim kings, the king of Abyssinia, the king of Egypt, and various letters. Many of the kings even tore the letter and trampled it. But still, he delivered the message. What we have to do is we have to do both simultaneously. We have to speak to the Muslims about Islam and simultaneously give the message to the non-Muslims. We have got no excuse for not doing a job. Then there are other people who say, let's see the Quran says 
that la continuo con valia din. To use your way, to me is mine. Therefore, we should not force anyone. It's, the Quran says it's not required to preach the religion. Quran gives us a clear statement. La continuo con valia din. To use your way, to me is mine. To use your religion, to me is my religion. Therefore, dawah is not required. See, these people are quoting the Holy Quran out of context. What they are referring to is the verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Kafirun, chapter number 109, verse number 6. But they are quoting out of context. For the complete context, you have to start from verse number 1, which says, Qul ya ayyuhal kafiruna, la abudu ma ta'buduna, wa la antum abiduna ma abud, wa la ana abidu ma abadtum, wa la antum abiduna ma abud, la kundinukum wal yaddin. Which means, that say to those who reject faith, I worship not that which you worship. You will not worship that which I have been worshipping. I will not be worshipping that which you want me to worship, nor will you worship that which I worship. To you is your way, to me is mine. First, you have to deliver the message. It says, Qul ya ayyuhal kafiruna. Say to those who reject faith, the question of rejecting the faith only comes after you deliver the message. If you have not delivered the message, where is the question of rejecting the faith? If they are not Muslims, why should we force Islam on them? Again, they are quoting out of context. What they are referring to is the verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 253, which says, deen. There is no compulsion in religion. But truth stands out clear from error. Those who hold the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will take him from darkness to light. Those who hold the hand of the evil one, he will take you from light into darkness. Complete the verse. Just don't say there's no compulsion religion. Along with it, you should say truth stands out clear from error. You have to present the truth. If they don't accept the truth, then you don't have to force it down the throat. Forcing Islam at the point of the sword, at the point of the gun, it's useless. But still, you have to deliver the message. After you have delivered the message, if they do not agree with the truth, you have to say, like Rafid Deen, there is no compulsion religion, truth stands out clear from error. But still, you Muslims, we don't do the job. You know, we are afraid that if we deliver the message, we will make enemies. We will lose our friends, we will lose our business, we will lose our wealth. And they give excuses. Let's see, religion, deen, it's a personal belief. It's something personal. Therefore, you should not interfere with things which are personal. If you speak about religion, it will hurt the other person's feeling. It's too personal. Therefore, we have to believe in our personal belief and let them believe in their personal belief. It's too personal. We should not speak about religion. I would just like to give them an example. That suppose you go along with your family, along with your wife and, and along with your small children to a hill station. Say you're going to Table Mountain. And after you have gone to Table Mountain, while you are chatting with your wife, or while you are having some snacks with your wife, your small son, who is hardly two and a half years old, he slips away from you and he goes far away. He goes so far away that by the time you realize that he has gone away from you, he is already gone several hundreds of meters away from you. And there you see that he is going towards the cliff towards the end of the Table Mountain. And there you find that the elderly gentleman, he is standing with his hand folded just next to the cliff and he is admiring the beauty. And you can see your son walking towards him. When you see that your son is going to fall from the cliff, he's too far. Even if you shout, it will not help. But you see the elderly gentleman, he is standing at the edge of the cliff and he is minding his own business. He sees your son coming close to him and he sees that your son is going to fall over 
but still he is a silent spectator. And after a while, your son steps over the cliff and he falls and he dies. What will you do? Will you come and congratulate the old man? Oh, Jazakallah, you are minding your own business. What will you do? You will blame him. You will blame him that see that elderly gentleman, he had the knowledge. He had the intelligence. He could have easily stopped my son. He didn't even have to take a step forward. He was so close, he only had to stretch his hand and my son would have been saved. But he was minding his own business. Believe me, he did not ask your son to jump over the cliff. He did not push your son. But still, you will blame that elderly gentleman because you say that my son was masoom. He was innocent. He was not aware that if he takes a step forward, he will die. He was masoom. Did not have the knowledge. What was that elderly gentleman doing? Will you say that, okay, thank you for minding your own business? No, you will blame him. That it's his fault, he could have saved my son. In the same way, when we Muslim, we can see that these mushriks, they are going to hell. They are going to Jahannam. And if we are silent spectators, we will be accountable. We will not go scot-free. Suppose you have a non-Muslim neighbor, and if he dies as a mushrik, on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you, will ask that non-Muslim, that, did you get the message of Islam? And he will say, no, I didn't get it. So Allah will tell him that it was his job. And Allah says, in the Holy Quran, in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, Sanurihim ayatina fila fakhi wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyana lahum anna wal haq that soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest regions of the horizons and into their soul until it is true to them that this is the truth. Allah shows the sign. It was the duty of the non-Muslim to find the truth. Signs were shown. Truth was shown to him. If he did not accept the truth, it's his fault. He will go to hell. And Allah will question you next. Did you Muslim? Did you deliver the message to your non-Muslim friend? And if you say no, you will follow him. You will follow him. It is your fard. It is your duty to do dawah, to deliver the message of Islam. You will not be forgiven. You will have no excuse to save yourself. Because Allah clearly mentions in the Holy Quran, in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, the four criteria for salvation are given. It says, while us, by the token of time, while us, inna al-insana la fi khus, illa alladhina amanu wa amanu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. Allah is taking an oath that by the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss. Allah takes several oaths in the Holy Quran. But the was Zaytun of the fig tree, of the olive, of the stars, of the mountains. But here Allah is taking one of the biggest oaths. While us, by the token of time, by the fleeting time, man is verily in loss. Man is in khasara. Man is in loss. While us, inna al-insana la fi khus, illa ladhina amun, except those who have faith. Wa aminu soli hati, those who have righteous deed. Wa tawasaw bil haqqi, wa tawasaw bil sabr. And those who exhort people to the truth, those who do isla and dawah, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. The Holy Quran says that man is in a state of loss except those people who fulfill these four criteria. That is Iman, having faith, salihati, righteous deed, watawasaw bil haq, exhorting people to truth, watawasaw bil sabr, exhorting people to patience and perseverance. Believe me, if any of these four criteria are missing, you shall not enter Jannah. You may be a very good Muslim. You may be a pious Muslim. You may have faith. You may offer your salah. You may give zakah. Every lunar year in the month of Ramadan you fast. You may perform the hajj. But if you don't do dawah, if you don't deliver the message, if you don't do isla and dawah, you shall not enter Jannah. All four criteria are required. 
If any one of these four is missing, that is faith, righteous deed, dawa, Islam, exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these four is missing, you shall not enter Jannah. That's the guidance we get in the Holy Quran. And if you read, the Holy Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 104, that let there arise out of you a group of people who enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong. And these are the ones to attain felicity. This verse of the Holy Quran speaks about full time dying. The earlier verse which I quoted of Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 110, and Surah Al Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, it was talking that every Muslim should do dawah, minimum, should at least be a part time dying. You have to compulsory, you have to dawah. But this verse of the Holy Quran talks about full time dying. Let there arise out of you a group of people enjoying what is good and forbidding what is wrong. These are the ones to attain felicity. How we are full-time doctors, full-time engineers, full-time advocates. How many full-time dyes do we have? We can hardly count them on our fingertips. Doing dawa part-time is compulsory for every Muslim. But amongst the Muslim ummah, there should be few people. There should be a group who should be full-time dyes. And it's the duty of the rest of the ummah to support these dyes. And the Holy Quran says in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, that who is better in speech than the person who invites to the way of thy Lord? Who is better? And the Holy Quran, Allah gives a promise in the Holy Quran. Allah says in no less than three different places. Allah says in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33, and in Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9, he says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْثَرَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَالدِّينُ الْحَقِّ لِيَذْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينَ كُلِّهِ وَقَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَيْدًا That we have sent the messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the deen al Islam, the religion of truth, will prevail over all the other ways of life. كُلِّهِ All the other ways of life whether it be communism, secularism, Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, Islam is destined to supersede all, to master them all, to overcome them all. Kulli! Wallahu qari al However much the mushrik don't like it, however much the idol worshippers don't like it, the similar message is given with a different ending in Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28, where it says, Huwa alladhi arthra rasulahu biludha. That we have sent the messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life. Whether it be Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, secularism, Islam is destined to supersede all, to master them all, to overcome them all. And enough is Allah as a witness. Allah is giving witness. Allah is giving a promise that his deen will prevail over all the other ways of life, with or without you, with or without me. The rubbish that we are, what are we? Nothing. With or without me, with or without you, whether you do dawah or not, Allah does not require us to make his deen prevail over all the other ways of life. He does not require us. He is giving us an opportunity. He is giving us an opportunity. Make hay while the sun is shining. See, we know that Islam is going to prevail over all the other ways of life. When we know, we should do the job. Allah is giving us an opportunity to do a profit job and to earn a profit reward. I would like to end my talk by quoting the verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Nahal, chapter number 16. Verse number 125, he says, Udu ila hasana, wajadilum ahsan. That is, invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching, and argue with them, and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Wa akhrud dawan, alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.
Shukran Jazilan, Doctor, I listened very attentively for most of the time, other than the time when I was writing. I would like to make use of this opportunity of saying that I've had the privilege of serving with Ahmad Didat since 1984. The opportunity came quite by accident and I was very scared and very skeptical. I didn't know the scene. I was asked by Brother Saleh Muhammad. And when he comes to Cape Town, as you may know, he does his rounds from City Hall right down to Rocklands in, and in Mitchell's Plain, other quarters, Hanover Park, Weinberg, you name it. I always felt, what happens when Ahmad Dirat leaves the scene? I'm no longer afraid. We have people, even in South Africa, we have taken it up. I now ask people in the audience here, if there's anything that you're not clear on, on what was said tonight, not what was said last week, tonight, then please come up to the microphone. We even welcome our sisters, please, to come and put your question. And if you have another question and there happens to be a queue, then after your question and has been asked and answered, then go to the back of the queue. And please give the people ample time to put their question and don't shout the person down. Let him ask whatever question he wants to. We now ask people to come forward and put questions so that you do not leave here with half the story. Shukran. Thank you. He says, do the job. It has been made easy for us. There's lots of references at your fingertips given by Ahmad Dida. As explained by doctor, it's also on the computer. He has given fantastic quotations tonight out of the Bible and out of the Quran, which makes you feel, but I can also do it. It is there for you. Please, if you need clarity, how to get started, let us start the ball rolling by asking a question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Abu Bakr and I would like to ask a question. My question is, I am at the school and um, where most of the students are non-Muslims. Could you advise me how to invite them to Islam? Beautiful question. Brother, well, asked a very good question. And he asked that since he's in a non-Muslim school, where the majority of the, his classmates are non-Muslims, how should I invite them towards Islam? And as you may be knowing, there are various ways and styles of doing dawah. Whichever is effective, you use it. But the, way, the one that we have chosen at the Islamic Research Foundation is that instead of speaking a thousand good points about Islam, normally what people say that Islam, they have got so and so good points, you don't have alcohol, etc., one, two, three, four, and we note. Instead of speaking a thousand good points about Islam, what we have a way that first we ask the non Muslims that what do you feel is wrong with Islam? Which are the negative points of Islam? Because even if you speak a thousand good points about Islam, and if that non-Muslim has two negative points about Islam, he will never agree with you. He will agree those thousand points are good, but still he will say, these Muslims, they marry more than one wife. These Muslims, they are circumcised. So what we do, that first we pose them the question, that what do you feel is wrong with Islam? Which are the things you don't agree with whatever little bit of Islam you know? And believe me, we have done a survey and we have come to know that the average non-Muslim, the 90% non-Muslims, they don't have more than 15 to 20 questions about Islam. They don't have more than 15 to 20 questions against Islam. So when we train a Dai, we first equip him with the answer to these 15 to 20 questions. There's a common question which all may be aware of, that why do the Muslim men are allowed to marry more than one wife? Why are the women kept in the way? Why is two women witness equivalent to one witness of man in Islam? 
Why do the women inherit half? Why is the Muslim man circumcised? Why don't you all have pork? Why don't you all have alcohol? Aren't you all ruthless people having non-wage? All these are the common questions. And believe me, if you can master these 15 to 20 questions, you can win over at least 90% of non-Muslims. And after you have removed the misconception, then even if you speak 10 good points about Islam, they will accept it. This is a Zen philosophy. If the cup is filled, and if you pour more into it, it will overflow. First empty the cup, then pour what you want to pour into it. So first, what we do is we, we encourage the youngsters to learn the answers to these 15 to 20 questions. And then we ask them to go into the field. And later on, then we train them with a little bit of words of the Bible, of the Vedas, of the Gitas, of the Holy Quran, and simultaneously his knowledge keeps on increasing. But first, we equip him with the answers which are normally posed by the non-Muslims. Because if we cannot answer these questions, they will start poking fun at you. So what we have to do is that first, we have to equip ourselves and make our, ourselves well versed with these answers. If you're interested in knowing any common question which your non-Muslim friend may have posed you and which you are unable to clarify, then you're most welcome to ask here. Because to give the answer to all the 15 questions will require another couple of lectures. But if you have any question in your mind which you'd like to know the answer of, you're most welcome. But you should start doing da'wah immediately. You should not wait and say that until I acquire the knowledge like Sheikh Didad or like someone else, then I'll start doing da'wah. You should start immediately to make a beginning. And you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, in Surah An Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 69, that if you strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will open up your pathway. So this is the way that we have adopted and we are very successful, brother. If you have any particular question, you're most welcome, brother. Or any one of the answers you require, which I posed a couple, you're most welcome, brother. Well, we first had the only child in the audience. Please come, Sheikh Fawad. Sheikh. Sheikh Abdurrahman Muhammad from Somalia. Welcome. Walaikum uh, as Doctor, you know, quite a number of times I was stopped in this one of the streets of the town by non Muslims just in order to convince me that the religion of Christianity is indeed the religion of truth. And this is just to mention one of the few challenges that's taking place between Muslims and non Muslims. And uh, being a Somalian, where I came from, where 100 of percent of the most of the population are Muslims, I was quite surprised to see that you hardly see a black man in a mosque performing salah, or you hardly see a white man who is a Muslim. Then there's something wrong with the Muslim community in this part of the world that needs to be treated, because. When we go and perform salah in various mosques, you hardly see a black Muslim, or you hardly see a white Muslim who is performing salah. And actually, I could not understand what causes this. And the other issue is, does the religion of Islam belong to a specific community, or color, or race, or it belongs to all mankind? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did he ever put emphasis that the religion of Islam must reach the Arabs and thereafter then it can be spirited to the non-Arabs? And what could be your advice regarding you are stopped on the streets of the town and then you are questioned, this is the religion, you have been given the Bible or scripts on that sort, then you are told this is the religion of truth, could you join us? And this is one of the mo most critical things that occurs in this part of the world. To conclude, I would like to know few, two questions. The first question is, does the religion of Islam belong to a specific community or it belongs to all human beings? That's one question. And the other question is, is the religion of Islam in favor of the Arabs 
the whites and the non-blacks. Shukran. The brother has asked several questions. Alhamdulillah. We had a person coming up later on asking several questions. Alhamdulillah. If I've missed out any, you're most welcome to remind me because I believe there are three, four questions in the two sentences we spoke just now. The brother has asked that is Islam only for the Arab or for the full world? Was it meant for the Arabs to deliver to the other people? And that when the Christians stop him on the way and say, this is the religion of truth, how can we convince them? And he has not seen any black person or a white person offering salah. These are the few questions he posed. Regarding the first question, that is Islam only meant for the Muslims or the Arabs? The answer is given in the Holy Quran, brother, that all the previous messengers that came before Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all the messages that came before Quran, they were time-bound and space-bound. They were only meant for their people and for a particular time. If you read the Holy Quran mentioned in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 49, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was sent as a messenger to the Bani Israel, to the children of Israel. It's mentioned in Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 6, that we have appointed Jesus, peace be upon him, as a messenger for Bani Israel. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was only sent for the Jews. If you read the Bible, the Bible says the same. If you read the Bible in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 to 6, it says, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, told his disciples that go ye not into the way of the Gentiles and enter the city of Samaritans, you shall not, but rather go to the lordship of Israel. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24, that I have not sent thee but to the lost sheep of Israel. That means Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was only sent for the Israelites, for the Bani Israel, for the Jews. Similarly, all the previous messengers were sent only for their people, and the messenger and the message was time-bound. But if you read the Holy Quran, the Holy Quran mentions Surah Al-Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107. It says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالْمِينَ That we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of mankind, to, the whole, to all the creatures, to all the worlds. Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not sent for the Arabs only, or for the Muslims only, but as a rahmat al as a mercy to all the worlds. Again, if you read in the Holy Quran, in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28, it says that we have sent thee as a universal message, as a universal messenger, for as a guide to the people who don't understand. A beloved prophet was sent for the whole humankind. And the Holy Quran was not sent only for the Arabs or the Muslims. The Holy Quran was sent for the whole of humankind. If you read the Quran mentioned in Surah Al Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52, that here is a message for the whole humankind. Let them take heed thereof and let them know there is only one God and let the men of understanding take advantage of it. Again, the Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185, that Ramadan was the month in which the Quran was revealed as a criteria to judge right from wrong to the whole of humankind. Quran says in Surah Al-Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 41, that we have given thee the book as a criteria to know right from wrong to the whole of humankind. There are several verses in the Quran which show you that the Quran was for the whole of humankind, not only for the Arabs or the Muslims. So this last and final word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since it has to be to eternity, that message will be true and is meant for the whole of humankind. And regarding a question that are the Arabs or some Muslims superior to the other, our beloved Prophet said on the in the Federal Pilgrimage, that no Arab is superior to a non-Arab. Neither is a non-Arab superior to an Arab. No black is superior to a white, neither is a white superior to a black. And the Holy Quran testifies that in Surah, uh, uh, Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, verse number 13, where it says, Ya, ya ayyuhan nasu, 
انا خلقناكم من ذكر وانثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وكبا الى تعرفوا انما اكرمكم ان بالله اتقاكم ان الله عليم خبير which means o oh, human kind we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes not that you may despise each other but you shall recognize each other and the most honored in the sight of allah subhanahu wa taala is the person who has taqwa who has righteousness who has god consciousness the only criteria for judgment in the sight of allah subhanahu wa taala it's not caste it's not color it's not wealth it's not age it's not sex but it's taqwa it's righteousness it's god consciousness <coughs> so it's very clear the whole quran was sent for the whole human kind he said do agree with you that the arabs were the chosen people on whom the quran was revealed so it's more of their duty to see to it that they deliver the message to those who do not know it as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala previously most of the revelation were revealed to the jews jews were the chosen people but for the last and final testament the arabs were chosen we got a question that if the christians come forward to you and say this is the religion of truth how do you counter you have to tell them that kul ha tum ghanakum produce your proof in kuntum sadiqin but if you are truthful you have to ask for the proof that what proof do you have that this is the religion of truth and whatever they say you have to analyze if they say jesus christ peace be upon him is the begotten son of god you can very well prove that he was not begotten son of god you can prove from the bible that there is no unequivocal statement in the whole bible where jesus christ himself says that is god or is he worship me and they try and prove that only if you believe in jesus christ peace be upon him will you be saved you have to ask for proof and if you tell them that if it is the religion of truth it should stand the test of time for example previously it was the age of miracles people did miracles to prove that they were messenger later on came the age of poetry and alhamdulillah quran stands the test of time quran is the miracle of miracles then came the age of literature and poetry and muslims and non muslims alike they claim that the holy quran is the best arabic literature available on the face of the earth today is the age of science and technology if you analyze the quran in the view of science and technology you will realize that yet it stands the test of time it is far more advanced than science and i have given a talk on quran and modern science conflict of conciliation and i have proved that quran stands the test of time it is far superior to science there is no single verse in the holy quran which can be proved scientifically wrong but if you put the same test to the bible there are several unscientific things mentioned in the bible you can give a talk only on proving that in genesis itself in the first chapter in the first few verses there are several unscientific points for that brother you can refer to my cassette and even the cassette is the quran god's word is there and the same question was asked to me and i have given the answer brother we are in the question of salah is suppose a christian poses me the question that why do all muslims pray salah the way you pray so i will tell him that if you read in the bible it's mentioned in the book of exodus in the book of exodus chapter number 3 verse number 5 that god almighty tells moses that draw not hither take off thy shoes for the place thy stand in is holy grounds similar thing is mentioned in the holy quran in surah taha chapter number 20 verse number 11 and 12 that when moses approached the fire he heard a voice moses take off thy shoes from thy feet for you are in the sacred valley of tua so this was the instruction given to musa alaihi salam which we follow today we as muslim but you christians you do not follow your own bible whereas to the other people we can say that we are hygienic people in the place of worship we don't want any dirt coming therefore we don't take our footwear into the place of worship and since we also do the sujood we do not we want to keep the place clean you can go to ablution it's mentioned in the holy quran in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 6 that before you offer your salah you have to wash your hands you have to wash your face wash the hands and arm up to the elbow rub the head with water and wash your feet do the ablution the christian you can say that it's mentioned in your bible in the book of exodus chapter number 40 verse number 31 it says that moses and aaron they washed their hands and face 
before they appeared before the Lord. Same thing is mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 7, verse number 33. Again, it's mentioned in the book of Acts that Paul and the men, they washed before they appeared in front of the Lord. So the Bible says we have to do ablution. To the other people who don't believe in the Bible and the Quran, we say we are hygienic people. We want to be clean before we appear in front of the Lord. Now coming to the point of Salah. The best part of Salah, brother, is the sujood. Is the sujood. When we ask any psychologist, he will tell you that the mind is not directly under your control. It keeps on wandering. Therefore, when we read a salah, our mind keeps on wondering that whether, whether my goods are being sold in my shop or not, what should I do during examination, etc. Your mind keeps on wandering. Your mind is not directly under our control. And the psychology will tell us that to humble the mind, you have to humble the body. No wonder we Muslims, we do the sujood in salah. And which acrobat can do better than what we Muslims do in our salah? And the word sujood, brother, is the most important part of the salah. It's mentioned no less than 92 times in the Holy Quran. And we can point out to the Christian that if you read your Bible, it's mentioned in the book of Genesis, chapter number 17, verse number 3, that Abraham, he fell on his face. <laughs> if you read the book of Numbers, chapter number 20, verse number 6, Moses fell on his face. If, if you read the book of Joshua, chapter number 5, Joshua fell upon his face and prayed to the God. Even if you read the Gospel, if you read the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 26, verse number 39, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, in the garden <laughs> of Gethsemane. He took a few steps forward and fell on his face and prayed to God. I want to ask the Christian that can an acrobat do better than what we Muslims do? Sujood, even your prophets, our prophets, prayed the same way as the Muslims prayed. Still, you may find some people who aren't they are not bothered about the Bible, they are not bothered about the Quran. We have to use hikmah. We have to use reason, logic, and science. Today we have come to know that when we are erect throughout the day, blood does not flow sufficient enough in the brain for a very healthy brain. It does flow, but it is not sufficient for a very healthy brain. Therefore, when you do sujood, blood flows extra into the brain which is very good for a healthy brain. Throughout the day, there are electrostatic charges being given out. Where do sujood, to the scientists tell us that these electrostatic charges, they are grounded. Not that you get a current, you put a hound, if you put a hand behind the musalla, but because of the dominance of the frontal lobe, these electrostatic charges, they are absorbed. Where do sujood, there is extra blood flowing into the skin of the face. It prevents you from several disease of the face, like chilbane. Where you do sujood, the secretion of the sinuses, maxillary sinus, frontal sinus, they, they get drained off. That's the reason that if you do sujood regularly, you have less chances of having inflammation of the sinus. It's known as a disease called a sinusitis. If you do sujood, there's drainage of the bronchial tree. You can give several medical reasons. We can give a talk on this. There's drainage of the bronchial tree. You have less chances of having lung disease or bronchitis. Where do sujood? The abdominal viscera, they press against the diaphragm. The diaphragm presses against the lower part of the lung. Because normally when you breathe, only two-thirds of the capacity of the lung is exhaled out. One-third is rest to delay. But when you breathe in your sujood, due to the dominance of the abdominal viscera on the diaphragm, and the pressure on the lower parts of the lobe, even this residual day air is exhaled out. So you have more fresh air coming in, and you have less chances of having disease of the lung. There are several benefits. In sujood, you have more venous return of the abnormal viscera. We have less chance of having hernia. You have less chances of having hemorrhoid. You keep on doing sujood, ruku, etc., and kayam, the calf muscle is activated. The calf muscle is referred to as the peripheral heart. It supplies blood supply to the low part. You can give several medical benefits. I've given a talk, Salah, the program into righteousness. And I've described it in detail, why we Muslims pray the way we pray. But anyway, we Muslims don't pray for these benefits. These are side dishes, you know, side dishes, which may attract the non-Muslims. We pray, we offer Salah, because we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
to praise him, to thank him. These medical benefits are side dishes. The main biryani is to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These side dishes may attract the unbeliever to come towards Islam. Hope that's the question. Any other question? You know, this meeting, yes, please come forward. Please speak into the microphone. Thank um, you. Salaam alaikum. Um, I don't have a question, but I do have a compliment uh, to doctor. And, um, um, I'd like to make dua for um, Sheikh Dirat for whatever the outcome may be. May Allah be pleased with him. And the um, doctor comes from a country where, um, which is much older than our country. And I wonder if the doctor will throw up a syllabus for our children. Because in this new era of the new South Africa, it seems that there's different tactics that um, the non-Muslim use to get our children away from Islam, inshallah. Inshallah. Yes, please. My brother, I made a suggestion, and I thank him for his du'as he had made for Sheikh Ahmed Didad, and I made a comment, and I do agree with him, that in this country, in the new era of new South Africa, there are different ways in which People are trying to influence our children. Maybe he wanted a re reply or a response that how should we make our children to see the truth and keep them within the fold of Islam and on the Sirat al mustaqim Brother, after a month or so, inshallah, we'll be inaugurating the children's wing of Islamic Research Foundation. We have the gents' wing, also the ladies' wing, but we felt the need for a children's wing. And what you said is perfectly right, brother. That we have to keep our children on the track right from the beginning, not after they grow up, we have to tell them about Islam. And inshallah, within a couple of months, we'll be starting the children's wing. And what I advise the parents is, and which is available on the video cassettes, if you can see my video cassettes, that we should know how to keep the children on the Sirat al mustaqim We have to use the modern technology, not that go away from it. For example, a child likes to play games. You can't say, okay, don't play games, only learn about Islam. What we have to do is that we will see to it that let him play those games that will take him closer towards Islam. For example, we all of us know about the Monopoly game. You know Monopoly? They have money, pounds and dollars, and they teach the child how to be a businessman, buying and selling of land. Similarly, we have in India the game trade where they have rupees and they buy different lands, Muhammad Ali Road, etc., you know, modern road. There's an Islamic version of that game taken out in the States and UK, which is called a Steps to Paradise. Instead of the start, there is Bismillah. And how in Monopoly, when you come on chance or community, you pick up a card and you have to read what's in the card. In this game, when you come on a star, you pick up a card. And there's mention that if you go for dance party, you have to pay a fine of 2,000 sawab. Yeah, instead of rupees or dollars or pounds, they have sawabs. They have notes, which are sawab. 500 sawab, 1,000 sawab, 2,000 sawab, 10,000 sawab. So when you come on a star and you pick up the card, it's mentioned that if you go for dance party, you have to pay a fine of 2,000 sawab. If you pick up the next card, it's mentioned that if you offer salah five times a day, you get a reward of 3,000 sawab. If you're obedient to your parents, you get a reward of so many thousand sawab. If you have alcohol, you have to pay a fine of 5,000 sawab. So now while the child is playing the game, and every child likes to win the game, and since the friends know very well whether he goes to dance party or not, if he's going to one, he stops going. Why? Because he wants to win the game. So besides playing the game, he is getting educated. And he knows that if I follow the rules, I will go to paradise. All of us know about the snakes and ladders. Snakes and ladders. There's an Islamic version of that, which I prefer calling as slopes and ladders. When you throw the dice, again, Bismillah, you start. You throw the dice, when you come at the bottom of the 
of the ladder, it's mentioned that you have kept fast throughout the month of Ramadan, you go up a ladder. It's mentioned that fasting, it, it teaches you self-restraint. When you go a few blocks ahead, you are disobedient to your parents, you come down a slope. Allah does not like it. Take a few blocks ahead, you have been reading Quran daily, you go up a ladder. You get guidance. Take a few blocks ahead, you have told a lie, you come down a slope. So when the child is playing the game, besides getting entertained, he is learning about the Deen al-Haq, about the religion of Islam. <coughs> Similarly, we have Islamic card, we have Islamic jigsaw puzzle. Instead of Taj Mahal and Ifil Tower, we have the Harmain Sharif, the Makkah, Medina Masjid Nabi. The child, when he makes the jigsaw puzzle, every nook and corner of that Harmain Sharif is part of his memory. We have Islamic game. We have got games on the computer for the children. We have got the Islamic scholar, where it's quiz for the children. So we have to know how to teach the child from the beginning. We have got nursery rhymes. Instead of A for apple, B for, B for ball, we have A for Allah, B for Bismillah. We have various nursery rhymes. Instead of Jack and Jill went up the hill, we have what is Iman, what is Iman. Various nursery rhymes. We have got video cassettes to show the children how to offer salah, how to do wudu, how to recite the Quran, etc. What we have to do is we have to entertain the child. We have to know what the child wants so that we can see to it that he remains on the Sirat al Mustaqeen from the beginning. And whenever anyone poses any question against Islam, you see to it that you equip your child with the answer. These are a few ways. For more complete answer, you can refer to my video. I think there's another question here. Yeah. Um, earlier on you spoke about the Trinity and that it was wrong to believe in the Trinity. So how do you like convince someone that um, believing in the Trinity is wrong and that there is only one Allah? The brother asked the question that how can we convince to a Christian, to a non-Muslim, that believing in Trinity is wrong? And believe me, if you analyze the full Bible, the Trinity is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. In fact, if you open the Holy Quran, the Quran, the word Trinity is there in the Quran, in no less than two different places. And even if you read in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 171, it says, Don't say Trinity. Just say, stop it, it's better for you. For your Lord and our Lord is one Lord. So the Trinity is there in the Quran, saying, don't say it, but it's not there in the Bible. The word of the Holy Bible, which resembles Trinity the closest is the first epistle of John, chapter number 5, verse number 7, which says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. This is the closest to the Trinity. And believe me, if you read, this was a quotation from the King James Version of the Bible, if you read the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, revised by whom? revised by 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 different Christian denominations. In the revised edition of the Bible, this verse from first epistle of John, chapter number five, verse number seven, has been thrown out as a fabrication, as an interpolation, as a concoction. It's no longer there in the revised standard version, because the revised standard version of the Bible dates back more closer to the source approximately 200 years after the going away of JFK, peace be upon him, according to the Christian. The closer to the source, the more authentic it is. But when you ask these Christians that what is the meaning of Trinity, they say that Trinity is that Father is a person, the Son is a person, the Holy Ghost is a person. But these three persons, they are not three, they are one. And when we ask them to explain that what do they mean that Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person, but they aren't three, but they are one, they say it's a mystery. No Christian born can explain the concept of Trinity logically. See, what's the meaning of a person? A person means he has a certain personality. The Father has a different personality, the Son has a different personality, the Holy Ghost has a different personality. And they say these three are one. So when we ask them the question, 
that suppose there are three triplets who look identical. If one of the triplet commits murder, can we hang the other? They say no. You say why? Because he's a different person. And believe me, no Christian can prove. Though they give several arguments, they give several arguments like see, first you have the ice, the ice melts into water and the water becomes vapor. They are three, but they are one. They fail to realize that science tells us today that when the ice melts to water, that ice no longer remains ice, it becomes water. And that water, when you heat, when it becomes vapor, that same water converts to vapor. It no longer remains as water. It becomes vapor. It's the same thing, only changing states. So do you mean to say, when the father becomes son, father is not there? When the son becomes the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is not there? Because we read in the Bible that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was there when the Holy Ghost was there. And he prayed to the Father, all three were present. So whatever reason that they give for Trinity, you can logically prove it wrong. Because these three aren't one. What you have to say, because the Bible clearly mentioned, if you read the Bible, Moses, peace be upon him, said in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4, he said, Shema Israelo, Haino Adnaihad that you are O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, repeated the same message, same message in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12. He said, when he was asked, which is first of the commandment? He said, the first of the commandment says, Shama Israelo, Adna Ilahaino Adna Ikhad, that you are O Israel, our Lord, our God, is one Lord. I hope that answers the question. There's another question, please come forward. Uh, doctor, we talk about Christianity and Judaism and so on, but uh, uh, there's quite a, a lot of people in South Africa that's atheist, that believes in uh, evolution and who was there before Adam and Eve, who was there uh, living creatures on earth or and stuff like that. How do we deal with that type of people? But there are the question that besides Christians and Jews, we have many atheists and I do agree with him. So how can we deal with this atheist? As I mentioned, brother, if, for, if you refer to my video cassette, is the Quran God's word? I have proved the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with reason, logic and science and proof to the atheist that Quran is the word of God. This, regarding a question that when they say about the theory of evolution, that who was there before Adam, and normally they refer, the moment theory of evolution comes, you start thinking of Darwin's theory. And they pose the question that who was the first? According to Darwin's theory, we have been evolved from apes. But if you read the Holy Quran and if you read the Bible, it's mentioned that the first human being was Adam, peace be upon him. And we agree with that. How can we prove to them scientifically that the Quran is more correct than what they believe? Brother, if you analyze, if you analyze Darwin's theory, and if you read his book called The Origin of Species, he traveled in a ship named as HMS Beagle and he went to an island called as the island of Calatropis. There he saw the birds and the beaks, the finches, they kept on altering, becoming long and short, depending upon the holes they pecked. So based on this observant, Darwin said that human beings have been evolved from a one species changes to the other. But if you analyze, he wrote a letter to his friend, Thomas Thompson, in the year 1861, and he said that I do not, I do not believe in the theory of evolution because I've got some proof, but just because it helps me in classification, in embryology, in morphology, in rudimentary organs. It was just an assumption. And believe me today, brother, there is no book known as the fact of evolution. It's only theory of evolution. So when we speak about Darwin's theory, there are some people who say that Darwin's theory is totally wrong. Some people who say it's totally right. We must in line between. We have got no objection accepting that human beings have been created in stages. Quran says that in Surah Nur, chapter number 71, verse number, four, verse number 14. We have got no objection that human beings have been created from water. 
قرآن تیزی سورة الانبیاء چپ نمبر 21 ورس نمبر 30 وجعلنا من الماء كل لا شئ حي and from every we have created every living thing of water Quran says in Surah Furqan chapter number 25 verse number 54 that the human beings have been created from water but unfortunately when when we are taught in school about Darwin's theory the teachers they don't teach us as a theory it's taught as a fact so the title is Darwin's theory and if you read the books by various scientists according to P.P. Grasse who held the chair of the study of evolution in Paris, in Shoja University, he said in 1971, he said that we cannot assume who were our ancestors just based on few vestiges and few fossils, few fossils, just a skeleton that we find. We can't assume who were our ancestors. But even if you analyze whatever research science has done, science has done today, we agree with it. According to the research of science today, brother, there are four waves of hominides that we have, which talk about evolution. The first wave was that of Lucy, which was about three and a half million years ago. It was also called as Dostolopithecus, and it died approximately in the Ice Age. The next wave of hominoids which they found in Africa and Europe, etc., was called as the Homo erectus, which died about 500,000 years to 100,000 years before. Next wave was the Neanderthal man, which died approximately 100 to 40,000 years ago. And the last wave was the Cro-Magnon, which is the closest resemble to the human being. But believe me, there is no link between these. No link between one Humanoid changing to another. And there is no proof at all today that in the higher level, one species can change with the other species. Otherwise, surely we'll be having some people in between, men and human beings, some people who are yet changing. There's no proof at all. Otherwise, theory of evolution, that man was created in stages, Quran agrees with that. Man was created from water, Quran agrees with that. That's the reason that if we have to insult someone, we say, that if you were present at Darwin's time, Darwin's theory would have been proved right. Saying that he's the missing link. Trying to insinuate that he looks like an ape. See, Darwin's theory had, had missing links. It's a theory, it's not a fact. It's just an assumption, which no scientist today will agree that Darwin's theory is correct. It's outdated. It no longer holds good. Hope that answers it. Hope that answers the question. Sure. Well, among my friends in that is when they work and it comes with Jumai is concerned and Salah is concerned and the bosses refuses them these privileges what do what do they do as Muslims um, where the bosses is concerned where the workplace where, where the work is concerned and another question is this uh, if a person fights for justice uh, a Muslim, for instance, can he, can he fight side by side? Not fight in actual fighting, but I mean do something, but can he work hand in hand with Nasara in the Yahud? Shukran. Because I asked two questions. The first question is, I suppose a Muslim is working in a non-Muslim company and his boss does not allow him to offer Salah. What should he do? And the second question, I didn't get it very clearly. I'll just repeat it if it's correct or not, that he said that if a Nasara who fights with you, can you be friends with him? That's the question, correct? I didn't get the second question. Can, can you? Can you fight side by side for a common cause? Can you fight along with him? Can you fight side by side for a common cause? Regarding the first question, that if a Muslim is working in a non-Muslim company and his boss does not allow him for Salah, again, brother, praying Salah is for five times a day you should offer Salah. There's no option at all. It's a fun. But we should use your hikmah. How to convince your non-Muslim boss. For example, we don't have all the five salah falling during the time of work. Maybe one or two. Especially the Zohar Namaz, Zohar Salah, or maybe Zohar and Asar, these two salah. All the other salahs, you are at your leisure time, you can offer. You can offer it at, in the masjid or wherever you are. 
But one you should realize, brother, that when you ask for time off, you should say that, sir, please give me five minutes off. If he gives more time, alhamdulillah. If he doesn't agree, say, give me five minutes off, I will work 15 minutes more. See, he's a businessman. You tell him, give me five minutes off, and after my time is over, I will work triple. Believe me, no good businessman will disagree. And if suppose the azan goes, and suppose you're doing an important work, very important work, you say, no, no, azan is there, I have to leave my work and go for salah immediately, that's also wrong. Islam is very lenient. It's preferable to pray in Jamaat. It's preferable. And if possible, go to the mosque. But if suppose you're in an atmosphere which is not very favorable, Islam has given you a broad outline. The timing is very long. For example, Zohar Namaz. After the sun has its highest point, till the midpoint between the sun's highest point and the sunset. It's for approximately a couple of hours. So if you're doing a very important work, and the Azan goes, and if you can't go to the mosque, if it's very far, no problem, you can pray after 15 minutes, after half an hour, when the workload is less. And tell the boss, you compensate more. If the boss allows you to go for jamaah, for the jamaat in the masjid, see to it, you go and come back fast. Not that maximum pray fard and the sunnat muqadda Not that you want to pray sunnat al muqadda and nafil, and instead of five, ten minutes, you take half an hour. This is what we Muslims do. We take undue advantage. Only there's a pocha pakarte. If someone gives you the finger, you want to catch the full hand, you want to catch the wrist. So you have to understand how to get the work done. And believe me, if you request nicely to non Muslim boss, I have not come across a single case in which the boss has refused. We are scared to ask the boss, what will the Christian boss tell us? Will he allow me? He won't allow me. The Hindu boss, will he allow me? Believe me, there are hundreds of people who came to me asking the same question. And when I asked them, have you ever approached your boss in the manner which I have told you? They said, no, you tried. And believe me, all have been successful. 99% of your boss will allow you, but you have to see to it that you cause them more profit than loss by your salah. And if there's a mosque is far away, you can pray in any room which is clean. So, but then you say, okay, suppose there's a photograph. If you work in a Hindu office and the photograph of Lord Ganesh or the photograph of Jesus, you say that he's upon him. I'll take out the photograph and then offer salah. See, that's not what Islam says. You pray in another room, he does not have a photograph. You want to push through. Then you say, okay, now there are 10 Muslims, we'll offer the salah with Jamaat and give the adhan loudly. See, you're pushing it too far. How much he allows? Make use of it. Make the best use of it. Don't grow out. Don't go out of the way to displease your boss. Islam is very flexible. If he gives you all the permission, Alhamdulillah, praying in Jamaat is very good. Otherwise, praying is fard. Praying in Jamaat is not fard. It's preferable. And believe me, you'll be successful. But if you come across a certain boss out of the 0.1 percentage, who at any cost will not allow you to offer salah, offering salah is fard, brother. You, you change your job to a job which will give you permission. And believe me, I'm not saying just like that. It's very rare. I have not come across a single place, even in India. See, here they are much more liberal. I have not come across a single person whose boss has not allowed him after they have approached him in a nice way. If you interfere with them, with their work too much, then they won't allow you. But with Hikmah and Husna, you say, I will work triple the time. Believe me, I have not come across a single place. But if out of the blues, if suppose there is a boss 0.001%, who does not say at any cost you should not pray at all, then you have to take a job which will give you permission. Do a job which will allow you to offer salah. And inshallah, it may be possible that the salary of that job will be much more better than the earlier job. Even if the salary is low, no problem. Inshallah, you're getting the reward in the year after. Hope that answers the question. Muslims have been accused of oppression in terms of women. The non-Muslims accuse Muslims that Muslim women have been oppressed, undermined, and underestimated. I would like you to clarify this with all due respect. And the last question is, what is the wisdom in that Allah created Adam and then Hawa? Shukran. Because I asked two questions, but how can we clarify that 
women in Islam aren't oppressed and we give them equal rights? And what was the wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam first and then Hawa? Peace be upon them both. But the, both these answers are very clearly given in my video cassette. Women's rights in Islam modernizing outdated and it's for approximately four hours. So if you expect me to answer completely, it's a bit difficult. But a few of the questions I'd answered when I was in the studios in Durban, when there was an interview being taken by SABC, and I think it's going to be aired on Sunday morning. And the topic was women's rights. But anyway, just to answer you briefly, not to reject your question, since you have asked with so much of enthusiasm, you should realize that the Western talk of women's liberalization is the disguised form of exploitation of a body, degradation of her honor, and her soul. The Western society, when they say that they uplift a woman, actually they degrade her to a state of concubine, to her society butterfly, which are mere tools in the hands of sex marketeers, which are hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture. Islam gave rights to the woman 1400 years ago. It uplifted the woman. And if you hear my talk, I've divided the rights of women into six different headings. And I've proved each one separately. I've spoken about the spiritual rights of women, the economical rights, the social right, the educational right, the legal rights, and the political rights. It's approximately one hour, 15 minutes talk. And I've divided each one and analyzed each one as compared to the teachings of Islam and the Western society. Just one point I have to clarify, that equality does not mean identicality. It does not mean identicality. Overall, men and women are equal in Islam. In some aspects, I do agree, Islam gives an advantage to the women. In some aspects, an advantage to men. But overall, both are equal. And one verse of the Quran is sufficient to prove that men and women are equal. That's from Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2. Verse number 228, which says that the women in Islam have rights equal to those against them on terms equitable. And it continues, but the men have a degree of advantage. And this is the word which many of us Muslims have not understood. Second part of this verse. First part clearly states that men and women are equal. And they say that this means that men in Islam are superior. And they quote a verse of the Holy Quran. Then they say, that the men are the protector, they are the qawwam of the women. What they're quoting is the verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 34, which says, nisa, that the men are the supporters and protectors of the women. Because Allah has given one more strength than the other. The complete verse is there. What's the meaning of the word qawwam? Qawwam comes from the root Arabic word, it means iqama which means standing up for. How we have ikhama before the salah, standing up for. Here, this verse refers to men have one degree of advantage, higher in standing up for responsibility, not in bossing over their wife. One degree of responsibility, since they are the bread earners of the family, since they have got more strength. So if you analyze on a broad aspect, that suppose there is a robber who comes into the house, you will not say that I believe, I believe in equality, men and women are equal, and you tell your wife to go and fight. See, since Allah has given you more strength, you will go and fight the robber. Similarly, according to the Islamic philosophy, according to the hadith of Sayyid al-Bukhari, volume number 8, chapter number 2, verse number, hadith number 2, it says that when one of the person asked the beloved prophet that who deserves the maximum of love and respect in this world, the Prophet said, your mother. He said, then who? The Prophet said, your mother. He said, after that, who? The Prophet again replied, your mother. After that, the Prophet said, your father. Which means 75% of the love and respect, the better portion, goes to the mother, and the remaining 25% goes to the father. Which, in other words, means that the woman gets the gold medal, the mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal, and the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the consolation prize. That's what Islam says. So here, the women have a degree of advantage. But overall, both are equal. For example, there's a student, I mean, there are two students who have come out first in the classroom. Both get 80 out of 100. 
and the question paper contains about 10 questions, each carrying 10 marks. Maybe in the first question, student A got 9 out of 10, and student B got 10 out of 10. So student A is higher than student B in question 1. In question 2, student B gets 9 out of 10, and student A gets 9 out of 10. Student B is higher than A in question 2. But when you add up the total of the 10 questions, both get 80 out of 100. That means overall both are equal. In some aspect, A was higher. In some aspect, the B was higher. Similarly, men and women in Islam, they're equal, brother. In some aspect, the women have a degree of advantage. In some aspect, the men, but overall they're equal. Regarding the second part of the question, that why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create Adam, peace be, peace be upon him, and then be Hawa, may Allah be pleased with her. That does not mean that one is superior to the other. Because Quran clearly states in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number one, that we have created the human beings from a single person and made like nature his mate. That means both men and women are spiritually equal. After Adam, peace be upon him, was created, Hawa, peace be upon him, was created, she was equal in nature. Spiritually, both were equal. The West have a misconception that in Islam, the women can't attain paradise, which can be easily clarified from several verses of the Holy Quran, including Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 124, which says that as, as, as to the men and women, whoever has faith and does righteous deed, be it a man or a woman, they shall enter paradise. It's clearly mentioned. And for the complete answer, brother, you can refer to my video cassette, Women's Rights in Islam, Modernizing Outdated, Part 1 and Part 2. Hope you're satisfied. If there's no further questions, uh, I would like to close the evening and ask you please to be seated. Al-Fatiha. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أو الله we thank thee for having granted us the privilege of listening to our brother Dr Zakir Abdul Karim Naikan we pray O oh Allah that he should be blessed with good health an abundance of knowledge and a great deal of determination and courage to keep up the da'wah work. O oh Allah, we ask thee to bestow and to return the good health to our brother Ahmad Dirat and to look after his family who is with him and all those people who are ill and unemployed. O oh Allah, we bear witness that thy holy prophet Muhammad وسلم, has delivered his message. O oh Allah, grant that we in South Africa also develop such dedicated sons and daughters to spread the word by means of verbal discourse, by writings, and above all, by the example. O oh Allah, protect us from evil in the forthcoming election and in the years that lie ahead. O oh Allah, protect us from becoming racists like members of the previous apartheid regime who placed chains on the brains of our people. Our people are currently being led by the noses, by the dirty tricks of the very people who ordered that our children be beaten, tear gassed, imprisoned, and even killed. O oh Allah, save us from going against thy holy commands. Protect us, O oh Allah, Protect our people from the evil intentions of the missionaries of other religions. Grant us, O Allah, an abundance of Iman. Rabbana innana sami'na munadi ayyunadi lil imani anaminu bi rabbikum fa'amanna. Rabbana faghfir lana dhunubana wa kafir anna sayyatina wa tawafana ma'ala biroor. ربنا وآتنا ما وعدنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد اللهم اشف مرضانا اللهم اشف مرضانا اللهم اشف مرضانا وارحم موتانا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا 
لنكونن من الخاسرين ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة عين واجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذا ديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وأدخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار يا عزيز يا غفار يا رب العالمين ربنا لا تواخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطونا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته ولا الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا توقت لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانسرنا على القوم الكافرين والحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة قال الله تبارك وتعالى إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وأسكاب وبارك وسلم اللهم افتح لنا بالخير واختم لنا بالخير واجعل واقب أمورنا بالخير بيدك الخير ولا في إنك على كل شيء قدير ألا إن أولياء الله لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يخزنون الذين آمنوا وكانوا يتكون دعواهم فيها سبحانك اللهم وتحيتهم فيها سلام وآخر دعوة أم الحمد لله رب العالمين تكبن الله منكم يا كريم شكرا جزيلا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته